character. Mr. Jim Gasoloom, who played Kelly Cartoni's uncle. Uncle John Cartoni. John, John Cartoni. How do you not know who he was in that movie? We, My we identical twin. shot anything since August. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. My identical twin. That was what Cartoni. five months ago. Five yeah. months ago. Identical yeah. twin Artie Cartoni got uh, wasted by the werewolves. The werewolf. Oh, if I'm not mistaken, you and Randy grew up together. In California. You are not mistaken, we did we did grow up there. And how long have you actually known each other? Wow. This is going back into the mid to early early. And it was the early seventies. Early seventies. The early seventies. The whole reason I found I, I met Randy is because I knew his sister first. And I had a huge crush on his sister growing up. In wow. fact, in that one scene in the office in this movie, mm-hmm. you know, when I saw it, when I saw the, you know, the blooper reel, and I haven't seen the, the entire movie yet, the finished product yet. No, I haven't. I wish I had. But the, there's a picture of Sandy above my head, and that was just, that was kind of real cosmic interesting. Did that so, on purpose. I know you did. But it was, you know, that was, that was the bonus. That was the bonus. I actually had... Getting, getting to know, getting, certainly getting to know Randy... And that was a, that was a huge bonus. <laughs> I didn't know Randy until I knew Sandy. Yes, but then the thing was, I was I, I'm an LDS convert, mm-hmm. uh, and I met you know I, I met the whole Robbins family pretty quick. I would think. Well, and you and Sandy became like pals really fast. It, it, so it wasn't like a romance thing. It was thing. almost like a brother sister thing. Well, I always thought that she was out of my league, but then there was one time where it became a little less and I actually Sandy was my very first date in high school that's another story and that's just totally ridiculous not, not for another time even to go in <laughs> it, was one of those, it was one of those things that everything that could, could have gone possibly wrong in a date did but it was still it was still okay yeah we've all had that date oh, no I had this date ten times over <laughs> okay we're here with Brandon Robb one of the stars of the latest movie well <laughs> one of the star really <laughs> <laughs> okay of the Angus Grimm Chronicles, Vampires. Yeah, kind of creepy. Kind of creepy title. Kind of creepy in a lot of ways, but a heck of a lot of fun. Brandon, so, uh, you know, first of all, you're a chiropractor. Yes, sir. You're like, uh, you have all the uh, all the training, all the classes behind you now, and you were an official, chi- you started your practice and everything? Yeah, I, um, I graduated last June. Congratulations. And uh, I was actually in school during the first movie. Mm-hmm. And I remember that. I filmed it during a three-week break from school. I was here just for three weeks and mm-hmm. we crammed everything in at once and it was really stupid, but we got it done. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, we had scenes together that we were never together. Yeah. Through the miracle and magic of movie making. Yeah. <laughs> and Randy's uh, interesting uh, cut and splice there. That, that's pretty cool. Well, congrats on that. Oh, here we go. It's Randy Robbins! James, it's good to see you. It's been so long. From this end, I've been standing back there behind the camera freezing my butt off. By the way, it's January, what is it, 8th? I believe so. 2011. Uh-huh. Movie's been done about a week. It is cold in my garage. But we got the green screen. But I'm actually sitting oh, by a the, heater yes. thing now, and I'm really happy about it, because over there, it's pretty cold. Let's see. Hi, it's an ADD convention. Well, maybe it's you. How are you doing? The two ADHD. Let's get it right. Okay, well, maybe. Speak for yourself. I thought you were ADHD. Come on. You can't be just ADD with all that energy. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I can be. All right. All right. We can cut this out too. <laughs> so Randy, we've Jane. shot three hours of footage with Randy and Jim, and it's going to be five minutes long. Here comes the first rhetorical question <laughs> fired across the bow. When did you discover your interest in horror and sci-fi? I can answer that question. <laughs> wow. But I'm going to let you answer. I didn't, she turned British on me. Okay. <laughs> um, I can tell you exactly when that happened. I was five years old. It was 1963, September 1963. A show came on ABC called The Outer Limits. From the inner mind to the outer limits. Yes, and everybody knows we that. Control, our age we knows control. We control the fuzz. We control the TV. The very first episode was called The Galaxy Being. It starred Cliff Robertson. Wow. Cliff Robertson was in the first. Yeah, I, very I first. And in fact, that. it was the pilot episode originally called Please Stand By, mm-hmm. and then it became the, the first episode. And my mother liked that kind of stuff when I was a little kid. She evolved to where she hated it when I got really obsessed with it. <laughs> but she liked it. So she had me watch it with her, and it, and it scared me. I was five. Mm-hmm. But by the same time, I was really dazzled by it. I so mean, you were drawn to that oh, show? Oh, yeah. I was like, what? what? And being ADHD. It was a good show. Oh, it was an awesome show. Being ADHD, I, I had a real hard time my whole life sleeping at night. And I would go to bed my whole life. And I have to take oh, that's sleeping. good. Let's do something so you could be thinking about monsters in the well, closet. <laughs> I, it's still, I have to take sleeping beds now to sleep. But mm-hmm. as a kid, I would lie there. I thought that's how everybody was. You'd go to bed and lie there for an hour and a half mm-hmm. before you finally fell asleep. 
And so every Saturday night, it would come on at 7.30. I don't know why on the half hour, but it did. And I'd watch the show, and then afterwards it was time to go to bed, because I was a little kid. And I would lie there for an hour and a half and just wonder how they did it. I knew it wasn't real. I mean, I was, I was still only five, but I still knew it was just like a play or, or, or make-believe. Mm -hmm. And I would just lie there in bed going, how did they do that? Because there were some imaginative monsters on there. I mean, there was, there was, one of the most famous is the little bug monsters about this big, yeah. but with human faces. Mm -hmm. And they crawled on you. And I remember one of the, in one scene, the bug goes up this guy's pant leg, and my dad was standing there, and he went, man, if one of those things went up my pant leg, I'd be screaming like a girl. And that was really funny to me. <laughs> and so right away, I became a big fan of a guy named Hua Chang. He was Chinese, obviously. Mm -hmm. His monsters are just very, very bizarre, very eccentric, but also very cool. And he would do things like, uh, if, if he wanted the monster eyes to be down here, he'd put this weird bone structure where the eyes of the human being playing the character were, and it did big ridges and stuff, and the back of those ridges would be cut out so the actor could see out of the mask. And it would hide, you know, so it looked different, but, and I've always, or, or the mouth needed to talk, so they'd build ridges up around here to hide the fact that it was a mask, and then it would go into where the skin was, and you'd just grease paint that, and, then the, and, and usually the monsters talked in a British accent, which apparently is the, the, the <laughs> accent of monsters. <laughs> and uh, and I just I still am a huge fan of a guy in a rubber suit or a rubber monster mask. I just love the look of that. And and the monster I'm actually going to be designing right now is a very outer limits inspired kind of monster. But yeah, for the next, for the next project for the, for our next movie, right. it'll be very very outer limitsy rubber guy in a rubber suit kind of monster. I just became obsessed with that. I just loved it. I mean, every Saturday I was just waiting for 7:30 because that show would be on. And then of course because of that, I discovered the Saturday afternoon. You know, I, you and I talked about Chiller and Seymour Presents and uh, Creature Features and all those things, and I learned about the Universal Monsters, and then I discovered Jack P. Pierce, who did Frankenstein and all those really awesome, iconic monster makeups from the 30s. All right, so it's obviously you have an interest in, in horror and science fiction movies and all. So uh, how did how did you discover that? You know, this. When did you know that you really liked horror films and, and sci-fi? That's actually really easy for me. Um, in 1986, James Cameron's Aliens, the sequel to Alien, came out. Mm -hmm. I was eight years old, and I don't know when when it came out on on VHS or Betamax, whatever was the argument back then. Um, but I was at somebody's house, and they they were going to watch it, and I was told I couldn't watch it. I was too young. <laughs> I had to leave the room for two hours while they watched Aliens of all things. So what did you so, do? You just hear it? Just hear no, it? No, I, I, I was just, I just remembered it, and I was really bitter about it and angry. And I think I was eleven or twelve when uh -huh. I was on TV, and I just, I just watched it, and I probably watched it between my eyes half the time because I was really young, but just loved it. Mm -hmm. It's still one of my favorite movies of all time. So I think that's kind of because it's both scary and sci-fi at the same time, especially for a twelve-year-old kid. All right, Jim, you have been acting for quite some time. Yes, I have. How did? How long have you been acting? The world is a stage. Okay, enough of that. Uh, a lot of it began, again, back in that Redondo Ward Torrance Stake. They had a juggernaut of a um, roadshow program with uh, the Spencers. The Spencers? Yeah. Brother Spencer would write the roadshow, Sister Spencer would direct it. And, and the whole, there this huge amount of youth. And for those that don't know it, roadshows are these one act plays, they're comedies, uh, they have a time limit. And it was, it was pretty big, very competitive, pretty big business, back business. Uh, you know, a big program. Everybody wanted to win, and Torrance State had some really great ones. But uh, we were kind of like the New York Yankees of road shows. We won a lot. A lot of the other awards in State, people in State hated us. Hated us for that, yeah. But they were great shows. And I remember, you know, I think I still have all my scripts. They were really, they were really a lot of fun. Didn't get, I got a few speaking lines. You know, nothing, never ever got the lead. But uh, the ones, the, it was okay. And then one thing led to another, moving up here to Utah. Before we moved up, in the late 70s, had a friend that uh, said, oh, you got to come over to Glendale Center Theater and see Christmas Carol. I thought, what the heck is this? And it was the first time I saw a, a staged play of that was center stage theater where the seating is all the way around, the stage is in the middle. And uh, two years running, I, I got to see... Dickens Christmas Carol down there. It's an amazing experience. And, you know, forget that. Flash forward ten years later, we're up here. Find out that the Hales have moved up here and they have two theaters. There's a, there's one that's the old Hale Center Theater in South Salt Lake. And then they had a Hale Center Theater in Orem. And there was a lady that uh, was the costume 
design person. And we worked with, a, you know, full circle. We worked with a road show in our ward up here in Utah. And then after that, and then, and then she asked me if, uh, you know, I would be the assistant director. I said, okay, fine. And then after that experience, she just happened to say that, well, there's, they're doing a show called You Can't Take It With You, and you should really audition for it. I said, oh, really? What kind of part do you see? And he said, well, I don't know, but just go down and audition for it. So I, I did. I wound up getting the first part, and it's, it's like potato chips for me. I, it, it's a lot of fun. And working on a Hale stage is just, it's a lot of fun. I've been able to do everything from, uh, gosh, the Undertaker role up, up here one time in Hale Center Theater for uh, Christmas Carol to playing a divorced Jewish therapist brother-in-law in a show called Bo Jess that was absolutely a riot. It was a lot of fun. So, so you got this interest in watching the stuff first, and then that naturally evolved into you making movies then later down. No, Where did you get your first camera? That... That's a, that that's a weird story. I, I never really got into making. I just liked watching them, so I would watch them all the time. And, and that there were there were certain things that I was obsessed with. Motorcycle racing. I was a huge. My dad took me to my first motorcycle race when I was three, mm -hmm. and I just became a huge fan of Al Gunner and Neil Keen, Sammy Tanner, Jack O'Brien, all these all these iconic motorcycle racers. That was an obsession. The Outer Limits got me to where I was obsessed with monsters and science fiction and all that stuff, and, and so those were my obsessions. What but. I had a really, and I don't want to go into this too much, I had a really tough childhood. I was a skinny, short kid, very shy. And, uh, of course, if you're skinny and short, all the bullies, you know, they, they zero in on you. And uh, I just wanted, so it was, it was a very brutal childhood. I had a lot of problems at home. I was ADD, so I was a very, I was a terrible student. I, I got, I, I got really bad grades, and you know, because I just couldn't focus. Yeah, we got the creativity thing going on, but uh, doesn't necessarily transfer to the uh, to the report card at all. Yeah. yeah, and I was just, and I didn't know why. Nobody, there was no one there to help me. You're a kid, you don't know, you mm -hmm. know. And I would, I would be in school, and I'd be looking over at the kids next to me, and they're on page twenty of the assignment, and I'm on page one still, and I couldn't figure out how. How did you do that? You know, and it was, and it was, it was ugly. And so, of course, I was in my family, being the, the middle child of three. Each kid had its own assignment. <laughs> Sandy was to be the great queen goddess of everything, sweetness, light, and perfection. My little brother Neil, no matter what he got involved in, and it was pretty much everything, he was the baby, and my job was to be the disappointment, <laughs> the underachiever. He, he's very smart. I had a, I got a, I, I had a really good, uh, my IQ test came out really high, but, mm -hmm. but I'm the underachiever, and I got very despondent, and I was very suicidal. So by the time I was 13, I was ready to call it a day. I had it all planned out. And the next big bloody beat down I get, I'm doing it. And right in that little window between the last bloody horrible beat down and the next horrible bloody beat down, I was in my parents' um, hallway. And I was looking for some pictures I shot on, on this little Boy Scout camera I had. Oh, you bet. I had one of those too. And I was digging through this closet and I found my parents' little brownie movie camera. Do you remember those? Yep. Just a little tin box with a little rudimentary lens, and you had to wind the regular eight film through it. And I and I went, what is this? And I pulled it out. And mom, what's this? You know, it's a movie camera. And I, the, Bing, I just instantly, with my interest in monsters and stuff, and that, boom, can I use this? And and surprisingly, because I thought it'd be a no, because I'm a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Because they weren't using it. They had never. I think they maybe used it twice in my whole life that I could remember. Interesting. There. Interestingly, there was a little camera shop on the corner of Anza and Sepulveda in a little strip mall there. Mm -hmm. There was a little uh, liquor store. We used to go there to get candy and stuff. There was a little camera shop. So I went down there and, I, and there was this old guy, gray hair, who uh, was behind me. And I just said, look, I got this camera. How do I make it work? And he took like an hour. And he showed me how to wind the film around. That's awesome. And he was like, I got this. This film is new, but it's more expensive. I got this out-of-date stuff. It'll work just the same, but it's half price. Do you want that? And he did all this stuff for me. I have no idea what his name is. I wish I did. I'm sure he's gone by now. But, I mean, he really showed me how to do everything. That's cool. And then we went over to the field in that movie that you're in, the bicycle movie. That was the first one. First movie I ever did. I was a huge racing fan, and mm -hmm. On Any Sunday was out, or had been out for a few years. And I thought, well, let's make a bicycle version of On Any Sunday thinking as a 13-year-old that I could do that. Mm -hmm. Have no idea how to make, you know, I don't even know what continuity is or anything. <laughs> so we just rode around in our in this field with our friends, you know, Steve Watson's in it. I don't know if you remember Steve, Steve Watson. Steve Watson, you bet. Um, his brother Russ, his other brother Ted, me, Brian Ellison, who was a kid I went to school with, and we just, and you. Was Alan Nielsen in this one? No. You didn't get Alan in Nielsen okay. didn't, I, I don't know why Alan Nielsen isn't in that one. Okay. He's not in either one of my first two movies. He wasn't available that day. Probably. And, 
I got that. Remember photo mat? Those little street corner things? That's okay. where I took the film to be. And we got it back, and we had to borrow somebody's projector because I didn't have one. And I, I made that. You know, I was, oh my gosh, this is, this is like a whole new world. And I became so obsessed with it. So, yeah, that, that was all I did for the next 20, or 10 years. From about 73 to 81, I made 60-something movies. I didn't realize it was that many. Uh, rumor has it you were Randy's first ever movie in 1973. Yes, I was. Do you if remember I... which movie that okay, was? Okay, was that Cruising with Gastric Juices, or was that a No, you were ah. in... The very first movie I ever shot was on regular eight film. Was it? Did it have a name? Did you name it? It was called On Any Monday. It was supposed to be our version of the racing movie On Any Sunday, but it was on bikes. So we said, "Well, it's On Any Monday then." Was and that on the? Was that on the dirt hills and everything? Yeah, over there by the Union Bank on uh, okay. the corner of Carson and Hawthorne. Okay, I do remember that. I was probably had that old uh, that old kind of fluorescent green banana. Yes. Yes. And you, uh, Stingray. It, you only wrote in a couple of scenes, you guys, and you were like, you guys are better than me. Why don't I shoot you guys? And so you shot a lot of it, actually. I don't remember shooting it. You I, did. I, I, I could it was, your, it was actually it. your idea. You said, you know what? You guys are better on the bikes. Why don't, why don't you ride and I'll shoot you? And, I, and we're like, okay. That was brilliant. That was a brilliant Brilliant. Part. Brilliant production decision. How did friends, people of the same age, like the movies, take them? I hated them. <laughs> hated. Hated. I cannot emphasize... Hated enough, <laughs> but you still made them. Well, I can understand that to a, to a certain degree. People uh -huh. people watch movies on TV and, and they're a certain way. And here comes an amateur kid, and we're just running around. And we didn't even have sound or anything. And like there's no sound. Right. And I used to when I got older, like 17, 18, I was dating girls. They would say things to me like, "Because nobody likes monsters unless you happen to be in that group." And I didn't know anybody who liked monster movies in those days. It was just me and my friend Alan, and we would sneak off and not sneak off. We would go to any monster movie that came out. In the theaters, we would go see it. Mm -hmm. We saw some crappy movies. But if you're not into that, people don't understand it. So I would be trying to date girls, and they go, you know, you should try to make the great American movie. Or you should try to make romantic comedies. <laughs> Which is the dumbest thing to say in the world. Okay, what makes a romantic comedy a romantic comedy is the interaction between the two characters. Mm -hmm. Which means they have to talk. Mm -hmm. And these are silent films. So how do I make a romantic comedy when you can't talk? <laughs> And I used to get a lot of people, all your movies are running around. Well, of course that's all it is. You can't talk. You, so basically you have something happen at the beginning, a monster appears, you run around a lot, and then it's over. What else can you do? I, I mean, you could put, like the old silent movies, you could put slates. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, this is terrible. We need to do <laughs> but that's irritating. Nobody <laughs> wants to read a movie. I'll read a book. I don't want to read a movie. And I didn't know what else to do. So yeah, we, and that I was... Love technology. Church people really didn't like it because it was monsters, so they thought it was the occult. So I started hearing as I got older that I was into the occult, and this would get oh, back really? to me. Oh yeah, there was a lot of that. Especially, I never heard. I never heard that of you. Especially I guess I wasn't plugged Redondo. in. I guess they, I wasn't plugged into it. Well, you. Why would you hear it? It would get filtered back to me because it was about me. Mm -hmm. People like to filter that stuff back to you. That's what people do. <laughs> And at first it was kind of funny. Yeah, I'm in the occult. Huh? Rubber monsters. That, that makes a lot of sense. And then it made me mad. And I got pretty angry about it for a while. Mm -hmm. And I got a little vindictive. And when someone would mouth off to me, then I would go out over the top angry and pay them back, which was probably the wrong thing to do. But I went through a phase of that. Yeah, that's water under the bridge, though. Oh, that's so, so that got you that got you into the making monster. You, you did the monster mask well, and the makeup. What and, happened with that is... Originally, we were, I didn't know what to do with movies. We would, I did a lot of animated movies because I liked being by myself. Mm -hmm. And so I would do a lot of single-frame animated movies, like, like Cruising with Gastric Juices that you yeah. mentioned. That was a sitting on the street. That was the first time we tried it because I didn't even know if it... I mean, I understood that single-frames is how cartoons was made, but I didn't know if we could actually make that happen. You know, doing that in the cultural hall at Torrance State, too. Yeah, that was cruising around, you playing basketball, uh -huh. and you're in that. You yeah. Remember when you were making the shot? Yeah. And it started with us out in the street in front of my house, just me and a, a guy named Scott Carter, and we're just sitting like this, like we're driving, take a sh one frame, move about four inches, sit like this again, one frame. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly time-consuming. <laughs> but that film came back, and, it, and we're like, it, it works. It really looks like you're moving around. And so I became very obsessed with that for a while, did a lot of that. We made some cop movies, which is ridiculous, 14-year-old kids trying to be the cops. Mm -hmm. Stupid. <laughs> and when I was 17, I hit on the idea, we should try to make a real, like a monster movie. And right about that time, I'd gone over to that same liquor store at, to get some candy, and I walked by the magazine shop, and there was an issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland. 
Now, I was always led to believe that I was kind of off and, out, and off kilter because I liked monsters. Well, here was a magazine for people like me, which I didn't know there were any people like me. Mm -hmm. And I opened it up, and here's all these letters to the editor from all these people from all over the country. That like monsters. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that was like a eureka moment. Yeah. I'm not weird. I'm not. There's a lot of people like me. Mm -hmm. And then we got really into it. Me and Alan, we'd, we'd sit around talking about, what can we do now? What can we do now? Let's, let's, let's do this. We've done, we've done werewolves. Let's do vampires. Let's do... And it just took off and became a life of its own. Okay, so next. You were one of the guys that got this whole thing started with making the movies up with Randy. Now, what's up with that? How'd that happen? Oh, jeez. So... <laughs> it's like deja vu all over yeah. again. Yeah. <laughs> Can I answer this before? <laughs> this is ridiculous. It's like Groundhog Day, but worse. I know. Um, so I was home for Christmas break like two years ago, and just before I went back to Atlanta for school, I was over here talking to Randy, and uh, he had found a box in his attic or somewhere with his original video camera and some old monster masks he made, paper mache, mm -hmm. mostly. I think he had one or two that were, were rubber, but most of them paper mache that survived. And that was it. I left thinking, that's pretty cool, and nothing of it. Then he calls me like two weeks later saying, Andy is telling him he should start making masks again. And uh, so Andy's in on this too. Andy's in on this. Uh -huh. and, start, um, and start making movies. And he's like, well, I can't, if I start making masks, I want to make movies. I'm too old to be making movies. You know, running around with you know, kids in a video camera, which makes perfect sense. <laughs> you know? So, but... Then I said, well, you know, if we had a script, it might be kind of fun. And he's like, what'd you just say? I'm like, I'm just saying if we had a script, it might be kind of fun to do. And he's like, oh, you shouldn't have said that. So we end the conversation. Another week or two go by, and all of a sudden he's got, I got some ideas. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, for the movie, I got some ideas. I'm like, we're making a movie? And he's like, yeah, we're making it. And then he starts telling me about Werewolf. And then we, he, I think he came up with the original idea, start to finish, roughly what he wanted to do as far as, revisit the original werewolf which ended with a werewolf falling off a cliff it didn't end really mm -hmm. and he started writing it and then we just bounced stuff back and forth through email he asked me to write a couple of things because he got busy and I wrote them and then he would send me what he did I'd look through it give suggestions and vice versa and it just panned out I came home and three weeks we shot a whole lot of footage so it was a collaborative project that was from West Valley City to Atlanta, bouncing back and forth yeah. between emails. Yep. Wow. So now, okay, taking all that background, you know, the, the 10 years of movie making, then fast forward, you're here, and you're here in good old frosty Utah right now. And it's really cold right now. Hadn't made a movie since 1981, and uh, suddenly you, uh, you get talking, Andy thinks that uh, you should probably get into it again, and then you get talking with this Brandon guy. I well, have to explain that. Well, Brandon's like the little side. brother I never wanted, I never had. <laughs> He's his, name, his last name is Rob. My last name is Robbins. He has two Bs. I, it's, it's kind of freaky. But uh -huh. what happened with the, my, the last movie I made was called The Dead. And it was had a lot of people in it that I really liked. Brett Allen's in it and John Quinn and some other people. But it was a disaster. It was all zombies. That's a lot of makeup and a lot of monster masks. Uh -huh. And what happened and with that... a lot of dead people. And a lot of dead. <laughs> what happened with monsters is we bought our first couple of monster masks. Like the werewolf or the attack of the werewolf. <laughs> and, and the problem with store-bought masks, they stop right here. So you got a mask on, and then here's the guy's real neck, and it was irritating, and I kept thinking, I, I want to make something better. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure out how to do it, and I, I started off making, you remember, you remember the paper mache monster mask, you're oh, wearing one. Oh, yes I do. That was the only thing I could think of, I didn't know anything about rubber, and I thought, well, what if I put clay on a, on a styrofoam wig head and paper mache around it? And it kind of worked. It didn't really make monster masks. It made like monster helmets. Because <laughs> they were just like rock hard rigid. But they yeah. did the same thing. They stopped right here. Mm -hmm. and you couldn't make it go down your neck. You get a turtleneck or something coming up there. And so that was a, that was a learning experience. I, I learned about... Finally, I, I saw a picture of Rick Baker, who's one of the great modern makeup artists. It's such a huge idol of mine. And it showed him standing by these foreheads for a movie called The Incredible Melting Man, or one of those. And I, and I went, that's how it's done. You sculpt. So I had to teach myself how to sculpt. Mm -hmm. yeah, because I can't go to school, because again, ADD, I, I, right. so I, I, it's much more fun for me to sit in my room and to try to figure it out on my own, because mm -hmm. I, I, can't, I can't go to school. And so I just move and clay around on these things and figure out how to make a head and then how to cast it in plaster. And anyways, I learned how to make all my own monsters. That's amazing. So the zombie thing, we, we wanted to make a zombie, so I made a bunch of zombies, and, 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 but it was just a nightmare. 
It was supposed to shoot three nights, and then two nights for special effects done. It took over nine months. And it just went on and on, and I just, you know, I'm really not having fun with this anymore. And I'm older <laughs> now, I don't really want to do it. And I got involved in shooting sprint car racing every Saturday night at, at Ascot Park, right. which is the local racetrack. And so I just, and I just got out of doing it. So we're here, and I, I found my, Brandon mentioned I found my box of movies in, in Monster Mass, and, and my wife Andy said, you know, you really ought to do that again. I'm like, I'm 50. I'm, I'm not going to make movies again. I'm 50 years old. Thanks, but thanks, but no thanks. And then Brandon started going, that's not a bad idea. It might be fun. And so I thought, well, I, I first came up with an idea of uh, maybe some aliens, outer limits like aliens land in a neighborhood and there's a laser beam battle. And I thought about that for about a month. And I thought, that might be kind of fun. And then I was like, no, I've, I've done that before. Yep. It's, and it's kind of boring anyway. And wh where's it going to go? Aliens and you fight, fight, fight. And it's over. It's like my old movies. Run, 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 and then, and then end. Mm -hmm. And then I hit on the idea of, I never liked the way Attack of the Werewolf from 1976 ended. It's, the werewolf falls off a cliff and it's just over. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you have to kill a werewolf with something silver. Right. So it never really bothered me, but still, in the back of my mind, it's like, that's dumb. Why did I wanted to fall off the cliff. I like doing cliff falls, which is so why then, it's that way. So then that got resurrected in your uh, Well, I thought about it. What if, we, what if we finally kill that monster for real? Mm -hmm. We could actually kill it. And then that kind of got me excited. 30 years later, we could actually finally kill that stupid werewolf. Mm -hmm. And so I had mentioned that to Brandon, and Brandon thought it was a good idea. So like he said, we started, I said, well, okay, let's try this. I don't know if, it, if, if it's not going to be fun, though. We'll do this one, and that's going to be it. If it's going to be another nightmare like that zombie movie, then I'm not ever going to want to do it again, and we'll do this one, and that's it. Mm -hmm. What was really fun was writing it with Brandon. Because I'm here in Utah, he's in Atlanta going to school, and I would write 10, 15 pages, and I'd email it to him, and he'd have it for a few days, and I'd get an email back, and he'd written some stuff. That was so much fun. I love the collaboration on anything. Collaborating with somebody is just so much fun. So I got a big kick out of it. When an email it comes, like, ooh, Christmas. <laughs> and I'd read. And Annie got really sick. She, she had a, a, a kidney stone problem. Mm -hmm. I and I wrote, look, Brandon, I can't work on this anymore. I got other things to deal with. If you want to write the whole sequence where you and Angus meet for the first time, go ahead. And I had it kind of figured out in my mind how I thought it might go. Yeah. But I got his script back just like a couple of days later, and I was reading it, and it was really funny. He's talking about how he's this, he knows how to do everything because he plays computer games, and that cracked me up. So I really liked it, and I thought, okay, this is really fun, and then Andy turned out to be okay. They, they got her straightened out after, it should have been like one day in the hospital. She was of course there. it's going to be longer. Oh, it was, it was, <laughs> she had to go back twice. She, mm -hmm. she had 103 temperature at one point. They released her too early. It was, just, it was a fiasco, but she finally settled down. It was okay. So then we finished the script, and then it was... Well, you were in it. It was yeah. really fun. So that brings me to another question. Did you really have people in mind when you were writing Werewolf oh, 2? Yeah. Or did it just kind of, okay. Right off the bat, I, there were three people I wanted. You. Okay. I wanted Brandon. Well, Brandon was supposed to just be in it for a short time. He was going to be in it, be this nerdy guy, get killed, because he wanted to work with me behind the scenes. Uh -huh. And you were going to have a much bigger part. But my schedule. But your schedule was a disaster. That. So we swapped around. But you had a smaller part, and Brandon had a much bigger part. And then because of that... He's rich and famous! <laughs> Not for one of my movies. But because of that, then the whole Kelly Cartoni, the partnership between Angus Scrim and him developed. And for Angus Scrim, first of all, Angus Scrim, the name, comes from the Phantasm movies, which we just love those movies. I don't know if you've ever seen them. The Silver Ball and the Mortuary Sticks People's Head and, and the Tall Man. And I don't just, recall that, but I like the name. They're low buck movies, but they're just so imaginative and so much fun. Mm -hmm. So we like to pay tribute to stuff in our movies. We use dialogue for movies and all kinds of stuff. So we wanted to give... We never named the police character in the original werewolf, because it's obviously a silent movie. So we gave him... So we named him Angus Grimm. That's the stage name for the actor who plays the tall man in the Phantasm movies. Oh, okay. So we needed... You just lifted that name. Like, yeah, it, like you put, put the Alan Nielsen name in there. It's a, yeah, it's a little, little tip of the hat to the Phantasm, because I really just really like those movies. That's cool. But for Angus Grimm, right off the bat, I, I had a friend that I used to work with when I was doing video production, Darren Griffin. And he was the first guy automatically that I thought of for that character. Because he just, he, he kind of actually, 20, 30 years later from the guy who played the original cop, he kind of looks like him. Plus he's just a, a good friend and, and I knew he would love doing this. So I called guy him up. too. Yeah, and he's a great guy. And I called him up and said, hey, we're thinking about doing another monster movie. Would you be interested? And right off the bat, he's like, yeah, what do I have to do? Here's, here's what we're thinking about. So he went and got his costume together. That was all his idea. I mean, I thought, he needs to have some kind of identifying costume. Mm -hmm. You know, like a super suit, but not stupid like that. And he got the hat and the jacket and the whole business. And so him, Brandon, you, for sure, I wanted you in it. And we ended up having to scale your character back. That, that, that kind of sucked. 
<laughs> and then the werewolf. I have a friend at work, Chris, Chris Brackney. Mm -hmm. Right off the bat, he would be perfect for the werewolf. So those four were the were the ones for sure, and then we added other people later on. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of fun making Werewolf too, but what made you settle on vampires for the second one? Well, the first one ended up being so much fun. If you watch that movie, it's not the least bit scary. But we, we were having so much fun that I thought, okay, these guys need to go after other stuff. Mm -hmm. And when we made the first Werewolf movie back in the 70s, the next thing we did was we did the, a, a sequel of sorts where the Werewolf now gets caught up with, we had a Dracula, and we had our version of Frankenstein, we had a Hunchback. And then after that, we did another vampire movie. And I was thinking, well, that'd be kind of cool. When we, when we started doing monster movies originally, we went right to vampires. So why don't we go right to vampires again? Which was, which was just nostalgic for me. But then I thought, oh, but vampires are really popular right now. And everybody's going to go, oh, you're jumping on the vampire bandwagon. <laughs> I didn't see any characters uh, not wearing their shirts in this one. No, we had no... We had, and we had nobody turn into dogs. <laughs> but... What do you I, have against dogs? Come on! I love dogs. I don't like werewolves as dogs. Dogs, okay. But, and I haven't really seen much of the new, the new crop of vampires. I've never seen True Blood. It's on Showtime or something. Never, I hear it's really good, but I've never I've seen, seen it. You. Uh, I don't like the Twilight movies. And nothing against the writer. Good for you. You made millions of dollars and all that. That's the, I mean, awesome. That's fantastic. I don't like dumbing... I'm a horror purist. Mm -hmm. I don't like the dumbing down of mythology for mass consumption. Okay. Fair enough. So now vampires turn sparkly in the sun, and, <laughs> and you got a guy, he's 109 years old or whatever he is, and he's got the hots for a high school girl. Well, that makes you a pedophile. <laughs> That's not romantic, it's creepy. Well, yeah, I see where you're going there. Well, okay. and I really don't like... Werewolves, to me, are half man, half wolf. So it looks like a wolf, but it walks upright like a man. It's, it's a biped. Mm -hmm. I don't like werewolves as dogs. First of all, dogs don't scare me. Second of all, that you do it for two reasons. One, you don't have the money for a werewolf costume. Or two, you want the high school girls, oh, I could take him home and just pet him. <laughs> and I don't like either one. Okay, fair enough. So was making that first Werewolf 2 movie enjoyable for you? That it was a lot of fun. It was, it was different. I'd never done anything in front of a camera before, and I was nervous the first day. And, but it was, it was so much fun. It was great. Um, so what's your favorite part of... This movie, the Angry Scrim, Angus, the Angus, the Angry Scrim Chronicles, no, the Angus Scrim Chronicles, vampires. What's, what's your favorite oh, part geez. of this movie? If you had to choose one, there's, or there's several. a lot. Um, okay, your top twelve. I think I think <laughs> one of them is Jarvis McFadden because I came up with that character. Okay. And so I'm, I'm proud of that character, even though Trevor's the one who pulls it off. Mm -hmm. I was the one who wrote it, and that. So that, that that's really fun for me. Trevor is awesome. Is that whole character? Mm -hmm. um, I thought the quelm was really cool. The big pumpkin monster we had. That was fun. Seeing that, seeing that uh, in the blooper, the real first. You know, just how that whole thing was. That's amazing. Yeah. And especially when when Randy was telling me about this, I was in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And all I could tell me was a giant pumpkin, and I'm like, that's not scary. Like, what do you do with a giant pumpkin? You know, the first thing I heard that, I, the first thing I was thinking of is, uh, gee, it's a great pumpkin, Charlie yeah. Brown, you know? Like How's this going to be yeah. scary? How is this? Well, it, it's like a big monster. I, it's uh -huh. a pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! Oh, Nobody oh. trusts me. It's a giant orange gourd. It's going to be Marie Calder's pies. Well, you were in the first movie. You had a smaller part, because we, you were just so was, busy, we couldn't fit you in. Yeah, we had, in fact, it was right here. We had to do some green screen stuff. We did some stuff in the park and by the door. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun. And but, I guess it was fun enough you came back for round two. Absolutely. And I was excited that uh, the timing and, and everything worked out, that I was actually able to be there when everybody else was there on that one day up in... Uh, Payson. Yes. Well, Woodland Hills, actually. Woodland, Woodland, Payson Hills. Whatever. Yeah, wherever it is. South. Yeah. That, was, that was a lot of fun. All right, so talk about this movie versus the first movie for you. Uh... <clears throat> More, more time intensive and more, more of an all day sucker for me this time around. Uh, and it was, uh, I, I really enjoyed the process more because more, more people were around. That's not taking anything away from the first, the first time, but uh, it was, it was fun to see a lot more of the product being produced. So I, I, I enjoyed it from that standpoint, and uh, being able to help in the later portion of that night, as far as being a little bit more behind the scenes and. and and just uh, you know, helping out in different ways. That that was a lot of fun too. So, 
Uh, overall, I'd, I'd say I enjoyed the process this second time just because uh, I got to see more of it being built. Built. Made. It's like <laughs> created. <laughs> created. <laughs> Ooh, that's so creative the way you um, said that. You are one of the few actors we've had in both movies that's actually played more than one character. You were mm -hmm. Arnie Cartoni in the first one. And now the twin. And now you are John Cartoni in the second one. Mm -hmm. uh, differences between the two characters. Uh, Challenges, the, perhaps. The first one, for whatever reason, I don't know what it was, maybe it was the heat, I, I just tried to put a good fellow spin on the one, I don't know, it was the bald head to my son or whatever, and that was, that was a lot of fun. Even uh, even though I had a lot more, I think I had more blooper reel stuff in the first one with with the the stuff that we were doing in here. For some reason, there there was this real long line chunk that I really had problems with. There was talking Arnie talking about the first movie he was in, so uh, that was that was a lot of fun. Um, but you know, it was also a group of old time friends. It was you, Karen Peterson was here, mm -hmm. so it was kind of all of us from yes. back in the day, which made it kind of fun too. Oh, that was that was an absolute blast. So anyway, yeah, if you see this, Karen, hi, we missed you this time. We did. Sorry you got killed off. <laughs> maybe they, they can have that. Maybe John married, uh, John and Arnie married identical twins, too. So. There, there you go. She's ever back up. She's That's always welcome. Creepy. You're always welcome, Karen. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> so anyway, that was, um, yeah, I guess I leaned toward the, the second second time was having, what was the original question? <laughs> So, was it which I like best? Well, no, it's just differences between two characters. Cause okay. Oh, the, between two yeah. characters. Yeah, the first one had that good fellow spin on it. The second one was more straight up, just using a, I, I think, more just a regular dialect. I didn't want to try to mention, mess with a dialect again. So I hope that worked out. So now, <clears throat> making amateur movies, the yin and yang. Uh, what's the hardest part of it and what's the most fun? What's the hardest part? Anything about it is hard. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Well, we don't have, we don't have any money. Mm -hmm. So we've got to try to figure out how to do it as imaginatively as possible without looking what it is, a low buck, and you a know, no buck horror movie. And I tip of the hat to you to, to really uh, get a lot of people enthused about it too, to be a part of the project. Well that is actually that a surprise for me, the way that worked out. Because like I said, when I was a kid, it was me and Alan and Scott Moberly was in them. You were in a few of them. Mm -hmm. But mostly people would not be in them. They just like, they would avoid them like the plague. And when we put Werewolf 2 up on Facebook, a bunch of my friends from, from work, especially, were like, I want to be in your movie. And I'm like, what? really? You want to, what? That's not, how this, that's not how this goes. You're supposed to go, that's stupid. And, and our rule has always been, anybody who wanted to be in one can be in one. We don't care. We're, we already are not actors. So I'm not looking for someone who can really emote with feeling. And If you want to be in it, fine. We'll, we'll work you in. And what's fun about that is, surprisingly, you'll get somebody who really is impressive. Kelsey Fails as uh, Simone, the vampire. Oh, gosh, yes. She was creepy as heck. I love that. <laughs> and this is a compliment. And she hey, Kelsey, you're creepy. Yeah. Okay. And I'm hoping I've seen the last name right. It might be Fails, but I think okay. it's Fails. Okay. Fails. Kelsey. <laughs> she was terrific, and she loved it. And she was up for anything. We said, hey, lick Trevor's face, lick the blood off, and then talk about how there's no brains there. No problem, she would just do it. Wow. And Bryn was really good and creepy, and Heather was perfect as the old style. I mean, every, everybody, and Trevor, of course, we've already talked about Trevor. Yeah, but really nice, really nice combination of people. And okay. everybody was out for having, they understood that our movies have one goal, is to have fun. Yeah, people worked hard, but they're, you're having a lot of fun, too. And, and it was, uh... And it, if, if it turns out kind of good, that's great, mm -hmm. and if people have fun watching it, that's even better. Mm -hmm. But it's really just for those of us involved to have fun. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, 20 years from now, you'll be able to look back on that, and, and it's always going to be, like for vampires, the summer of 2010. Mm -hmm. No matter what else, whether it's a good movie or a bad movie, whether you like it, you don't like it, through, it's still going to be, for your personal history, the summer of 2010. And through modern technology, it's not going to be pulled out of a, a shoebox. It's, uh, it's already out for consumption, and a lot more people have seen them uh, than any other Robbins productions. Well, and, in, that, and that's another cool thing. That really is. Back in the day, if you wanted to see one of my movies, you had to come over to my house. I had to thread it up on a projector. We had to find a dark place, and then I would show it to you. Roll them. But now I can give a copy to anybody who's involved, and they can keep it and watch it whenever they feel like watching it. But the hardest things are, getting back to your question. Okay. Yeah, yin yang. Hardest yeah. and the most fun. The hardest thing is, we had a big cast in this movie. Yes. Excuse Impressive. me, and we had a lot more locations and a lot more. This movie had a lot more of everything. Mm -hmm. 
So just trying to get everybody together, and we knew right off, a lot of the people that are in this movie I work with, well, someone's going to have to be at work. We can't all be off. So we're going to have to chroma key people in. And we knew that fundamentally at the beginning. So there's going to be a lot of chroma key. Chroma keys for us, we haven't really gotten it down to a science yet. It's very iffy. Sometimes we, well, I'll set the camera up here, and we'll get perfect chroma key from somebody. The next person comes in, and we'll set it up exactly the same, and we'll have chroma key that doesn't work. So we have to shoot it again. So chroma key is still, we're not, we haven't gotten that perfectly down yet. That's an issue. The green screen suit was a nightmare. <laughs> but fun to watch the process. <laughs> it's, it seemed like such a great idea. Uh -huh. Chroma key suit, you can put anything you want. We'll put fire over it. So the vampires burst into flames, it'll be cool. The problem is, the light hits the green screen suit. Right there is good solid green, but as it goes around your body, Not so much. it's a different color of green. Mm -hmm. So you try to chroma key that color, but it's only taking in a certain part of the body, and we really don't have enough lights to, to line completely around the guy to get the solid green color all the way mm -hmm. around. And we shot that over and over and over. We're here at my house in the backyard. Brandon was here some nights. Yeah. Darren was here all the time because we had to have his fog machine with us to, to right. simulate burning. And I'm the idiot in the green screen suit <laughs> because I bought it because it to fit you. me. Mm -hmm. So I'm always in all this smoke or acting like I'm burning uh, and just never could... I finally just okay, this is how it's going to have to be. And it's not perfect in the movie, which but, is irritating. But we finally just... I can't keep shooting this over and over forever. Mm -hmm. We're done. That there was tough. We came up with an effect for your scene in the kitchen, where you and Heather, you haven't seen that yet, because we only shot that. your part one night, and we shot her part. I wanted her to look like she was drifting on the breeze, which reminds me of a scene I saw in the original Salem's Lot movie, where this guy comes up to the second floor, and he's hanging outside the window, and he's floating around. I thought that was really cool. <laughs> and I copy stuff all the time. I don't care. Invitation, sincere, sincere I just always liked the way I did. I hated that movie. It was terrible. It mm -hmm. was not a faithful rendition, uh, representation of Sandals Lot at all. But I liked that scene. So was that difficult to pull off? We never could get it to work. We were going to have her on a ladder. It was going to be very simple. On a ladder, a couple of guys moving her around like this, and we just could never get it to work. So she's just standing on a ladder outside the window, and that's disappointing. I really wanted her to look, be drifting. Because you mentioned it in the movie, she, it was like she was floating on the breeze. But then you watch it; yeah. she's just standing there. So that's <laughs> she's floating on a breeze that's uh, very just static. It's a breeze. It's a breeze that's coming right from. Under. It's like a concrete it's breeze. It's kind of like that breeze that comes under Marilyn Monroe's skirt when she's in that. Okay, never mind. No, it's, it's nothing like that because she doesn't move at all. Okay. That's that's a disappointment. <laughs> the most okay. fun things is that was that part of your question? Yes. What was the most fun? Every, it, everything is really hard, but it's fun. And, and that's another thing. Uh, one more thing. I don't mean to digress, but yes, you do. <laughs> horror movies has to take place at night for the most part, especially the horrible parts. Mm -hmm. Well, here in Utah, it doesn't get dark in the middle of summer until 10 o'clock at night. People have to work the next day. And yeah, that was late night, the one night I was oh. there. But uh, still a lot of So fun. everybody comes over. We shot a lot of it at this park right over here, Hunter, Hunter something park, which mm -hmm. is an awesome park. It's got power everywhere and a lot of space. And we, could, and we shot the opening part that's supposed to be in Vegas there. We shot part of the battle scene that's supposed to be at my mom's house there. We shot the finale that's supposed to be the graveyard there, which is a great park. I'm sure we'll use it a lot. Mm -hmm. But you only have this little window. 10 to about 12, 12, 30. People got to go home and go to bed. They got to go to work the next day. Right. So everything we shoot has just got this time crunch. So we're shooting, 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 shooting. And good night. And we're trying, and I try to have all the stuff in my head of how I want to do it before we get there. And then we get there, and it's just so fast. And so we're always under the gun there. The fun part is that everybody, when people first show up, like Brandon will tell you, his first day he was really nervous because he'd never done it before. And most people who are in my movies have never done it before. So they think that we're going to, be hard on them or, you know, I don't know what they think, but they're probably worried that people are going to not like what they're doing. Me, on the other hand, I've worked with you before. I was just looking, you know for, the, I am. I was looking for the bike. <laughs> <laughs> where's the, where's the paper machine helmet? Yeah, where is that? Okay, I can get used to that. But we're really there to have fun. More than anything else, I want people to have fun. I want people to have fun and I want them to collaborate with me because I'm, clearly I don't know everything. So I want them to make suggestions. And what's the most fun is when people are on the set and they're going, you know, I don't think my character would say that. I think my character would actually do this and this. Cool, we'll just shoot that. Mm -hmm. If it works, we'll shoot it the way it's in the script, and then we'll shoot whatever you think. And a lot of times, what they come up with is way better. Yeah. And so, or they'll say, why don't we go over here and do this? Yeah, let's try it. What's, what's the worst that can happen? So we will, and a lot of times, people's ideas are way better than what we came up with. And, of course, that makes the script evolve a little bit, but that's... That's fun, too. So were there, there were those decisions you made on the fly, sometimes people coming up with a good idea. You that's try really it, looked fun. at it great, and it got incorporated into the final movie. Lots of times. That's but great. I, off, that, off, the, off the cuff, I can think of Jason Kelly mm -hmm. came up with the idea that when Kelsey's fighting with... Well, in fact, Brandon and... Hey, Sorry, can I come out there? 
people are walking in on the set. Come on in. Sorry. Brandon and, and Darren came up with the idea. Well, we didn't want Trevor to die because he was just really fun. So we decided he sh he's not going to die during the battle scene. He's going to live. Mm -hmm. And they came up with the idea, well, what if Kelsey just beats the crap out of him at the end? <laughs> and then when the next movie starts, he'll be all bandaged up, uh -huh. which I thought was really funny and, and really cool. So that's like one of the things that happened. That was their idea. Uh, Jason Kelly came up with the idea. Well, during the fight, she was going to just strangle him up against the wall. And he said, why don't I get up underneath her and you know shoot this way and make it look like she lifts him up off to the ground. That, that shows that she's really strong, vampire strong, and she could hold him up in the air. And I thought, great idea. That just little things like that just mm -hmm. add stuff to the to the movie, which are just I love collaborating with anybody who's got a cool idea. So when people realize that that we like that, plus when they make a mistake and we all start laughing, then people relax and then they start having fun. And, and the laughing is always probably the most fun. Whenever you're mm -hmm. cracking up at somebody, you would know you made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yes, I made my share. So, okay, there's a lot of fun things that happen, but what was the funniest moment for you in, uh, in this project, this one in the Angus Grimm Chronicles? This movie, most of them involve Angus. Mm -hmm. um, there was one time, and this was, actually, this was actually planned. I was outside in the backyard doing the bomb stuff, mm -hmm. and Angus comes up talking like Arnold Schwarzenegger oh, to me. That's right, that was in the blooper reel, too. And, <laughs> And, and it was planned. We knew he was going to do it, and I still almost fell over laughing so hard. Mm -hmm. And there's another one, uh, same day in uh, Randy's mother's house, where it was my character and Angus and your character, John Cartoni, mm -hmm. talking. And he just looks over and he says something about, like, wait a man up or something. And yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was just brilliant. <laughs> that wasn't in the script. He just, <laughs> yeah. he, he just did he that. Just, and we all cracked up. Dead straight face, wait a man up, and looked right back like nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, caught me so off now. guard. So how was the making of this movie so much different from the last movie? Oh, geez, in so many ways. Um, the first movie, we were still in the process of trying to figure out like what we are going to do, and we'd never done it before. At least, well, Randy hadn't done it in 20-some-odd years. I had never done it, and it was a scramble. Plus a three-week block of time for me was just ridiculous, mm -hmm. and so it was, it was it was almost like a, a mad dash at times. The last one, this one, we could spread out a little more. We had more time to think about it, more time to plan it. We worked on it for another two or three months longer than the first one, getting it ready. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that made a big difference, just having more time and being able to to slow down the pace, so we just didn't kill ourselves. Right. Um, and this movie I think has a lot more action in it has a lot more kind of that running, jumping, fighting feel. Um, it's much darker, more intense. The first one we just, I'm sure we thought it might be scary, but it was just us goofing around for 70 minutes. <laughs> and I don't even know if you approached a character, because I don't know if you've even looked at it, but mm -hmm. did you have an approach before you showed up? I mean, was there something you thought about, or did you just wing it as you got there? I thought about it a little bit, but... Again, without meeting the other... Well, I knew, you know, of course I knew Brandon, his character from the last movie, and I knew I was going to be working with him. But then it's part of surroundings and just kind of getting a feel for, for what's happening. So being, I guess the advantage between doing a movie as opposed to acting, you know, live theater on stage, the process is more labor-intensive getting ready for, ready for the theater because there's blocking, you know, you're going in... You know, you're in a different area on the stage when you're when you're delivering a line and there's there's a continuity in in the performance that has to be repeated. In a movie you could take a, a smaller bite and, and the director figure out figures out what he wants to do and through the context of that conversation um, you just kinda get a feel for for sliding and I, I think yeah that this time this cartoonies character worked, you know, kind of developed a little bit more on set. I try not to go in, in there with too many preconceived notions of the fact that I wasn't going to be using a dialect this time. So it felt good. I haven't really I haven't really seen it. I haven't got to that part in, in looking at the finished product yet on um, the Facebook chunks that you have yet. But uh, I've really liked what I've seen so far. So I'm, I'll be looking forward to seeing that. <sighs> it, although in terms of seeing yourself on screen, hearing your voice, you know, your voice from your head sounds different than what it is. You know, when it's recorded, so it's going to be kind of strange, but oh well. I hope, I hope it isn't too distracting. Between that and being so gosh darn tall. 
Yeah. Usually when it, in a theater, you know, I, usually I get blocked to sit down a lot so it doesn't turn into Gulliver's Travels with me being so tall. But through the miracle of cameras, I don't think that's going uh, to be a factor. But you do have to be a little creative. No, I try to. Brandon, stand on a box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, hunch over with you. The Quelm, the Quelm, the big pumpkin the monster. Quelm, which Brandon hated. <laughs> Brandon, I told him, it's going to be this giant pumpkin monster. That's stupid. Mm -hmm. What happened was when we were shooting Werewolf 2, uh, Kelsey Martin and her husband Clint, she gets the one that gets scalped in Werewolf 2. Mm -hmm. And that was her idea. That was another piece of collaboration. She has alopecia, which is, she doesn't have any hair. And she said, well, why don't you have your werewolf scalp me? And I go, well, I don't. and I didn't know she had alopecia. I'm like, well, how are you going to do that? That sounds expensive, you know, I'm always worried about. She goes, well, I have alopecia. And she lifted up her, her uh, wig. And I thought, it freak you out? But no, <laughs> it didn't really freak me out, but I thought, a lot of people who have these kinds of things are a little shy about it. She didn't mm -hmm. care. I have this. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we wrote that into the script. So we went over to her house out in, um, oh, wherever that is south of us now. I can't think of where it is. Okay, Kearns? Way south. Past the military base. Uh, Eagle Mountain. Buffalo Eagle Mountain. Okay. Eagle Mountain. And we shot it in their, in their home. Mm -hmm. And we, so we shot the whole thing. And that is so cool. Clint provided the big wound on his neck. He got that at a, at a Halloween store. So we just stuck it on him, and it works perfectly. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, you know, I've got this, this costume that I use when I, when I do spook alleys. And I said, well, let's, let's see it. And he whipped out this nine-foot-tall, giant pumpkin monster, big hands, and he had a full costume. And he goes... Can you work this into a movie? And I'm like, yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a way we can work that in. And we needed to have a way in the vampire movie of... Well, well, well I was worried about Brandon not going to be living in Utah because he was graduating from college and he was talking about going maybe looking in California, maybe looking in Nevada. So I was worried that he wasn't going to be around anymore. So I wrote a cliffhanger ending, which is where he ends up out on the salt flats in that weird orange light stuff. Because if if he's gone for a while, well, we'll just leave him out there, and we're trying to. And part of the ongoing shtick can be we're trying to figure out how to get him back, and, but just keep going on without him, which sucked. But we had to come up with some idea in case Brandon was going to be living somewhere else, and we could have him if he comes up for Christmas. We'll shoot some scenes, you know, and work him into the movies that way. Fortunately, he's living here. Then he's, he's living in. Where are you, Bountiful now? I live in Bountiful. Practices in, in Layton. In Layton. Practice. Oh, you're in Layton. Mm -hmm. Yes. We gotta talk. <laughs> you guys can talk right now. <laughs> well, thank God. I mean, that's awesome. So he's living here. So um, we'll, anyway, so we'll we'll go rescue him in the next movie. But we had to figure out a way to get him kidnapped to this other place. And right off the bat, I thought of Clint's big pumpkin monster costume. And that's where the whole battle scene comes from. We I needed to have some way to get this pumpkin to where the good guys are staying. So what if the what if the vampires? create this whole battle thing, but it's just a ruse. It's to lure everybody outside, get them all busy, and plant this pumpkin mm -hmm. that they'll hopefully take back inside the house, and it'll become this creature that kidnaps. Yeah, I like that. Right. Oh, look, a pumpkin. <laughs> well, <laughs> you'll notice in the battle scene, the vampires really don't get involved. One vampire gets killed, and the only reason Crystal dies is she had to go back to school in Idaho, so we had to get rid of her, so we killed her. <laughs> but no vampires were actually supposed to die. They were supposed to involve you, get close to you, and then, and then back off. And to keep luring you away so that Heather and, and her husband Charles could sneak up with the pumpkin, plant it, leave, and then everybody disappears. And that's kind of how the battle scene goes. As soon as the pumpkin's there, they all disappear, and everybody's like, well, what was that all about? You should have put some, like, PETA thing in the, in the credits, like, no, no, actual, no, no actual vampires were <laughs> armed in the making of this production or something. <laughs> That's, uh, so that's what. Fun. So anyway, so and then the Quell name comes from my little brother when when computers got big in the early '80s. Mm -hmm. There were adventure games, and my brother and I were both playing the same one at my parents' house because they had a computer. And his character name was Quell, well. which I thought was like the coolest computer name ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and it made, I was like jealous. I wish I could have thought of something cool like that. And it's just all just stuck, stuck in my head. Nice so when I was use it. when I was coming up with the character, I thought. Quelm. It's, it's a quelm. I don't even know what a quelm is, but that's the name. So, tip of the hat to my little brother for coming up with the name In homage, in homage to Neil. Ago. That's very yeah. good. That's where that came from. Okay, so Vampires is a lot darker than the previous movie, than the, the werewolf one. Now, was this a conscious decision well, for you to go darker on it, or did it just evolve that no, way? No, no, I really wanted... I've never made well, a you movie... said that you, you didn't want happy, sparkly vampires well, that, or anything, so... Yeah, You know, it's going to be a little darker. But I watched Werewolf 2, and I still watch it, and I still love it, but it's just us having fun. It's not even remotely scary, and I've never made a scary movie, ever. Okay. It's just kids running around, having a good time, and I'm very proud of that, and I love all those movies. But, 
But <laughs> we're supposed to be dealing with horror and monsters. I would like to at least try to do something. Uh, ratchet up a little bit. That might at least scare a kid. Okay. Some small, some small child somewhere. Uh, at least, oh, well, I scared somebody. So th before we went into, it, I said, okay, this movie has to be darker. Uh, and and so Brandon and I were writing again because he was still going to school, and we were writing the same way because that's really fun to do that. And he wrote this whole long segment that was just very funny. Well, the first thing he wrote was that second flashback thing mm -hmm. where Crystal comes out of the house. And that scene is another disappointment. That oh, scene geez. was a lot longer. We <laughs> shot twice the amount of stuff on that scene. Brandon actually drives by in a car. as It's just supposed to be some random guy. And you're thinking she's being followed. But a guy drives by in a car. Hey, baby, what are you doing? And then drives off. Oh, it, there was nobody following her. It was just a guy in a car. And then, of course, it turns out there was. But for some reason, my camera picked up a glitch. And it double printed half the footage we shot, and it just never printed the other half that we shot. Oh. And Crystal was back in college now, we can't reshoot it, so I had to actually piece that sequence together from bits of what I had. I thought when I downloaded all that to my computer, I go, okay, everything's here, I, I see it all good. We don't have to worry about it. We oh, shot that yeah. months. If had I gone through it, I would have found right off. That it wasn't there. But we shot it months, and I didn't get to editing it until months later, she's back in school, we're stuck. I didn't have her screaming as a reaction to, to uh, Tyler showing up. Mm -hmm. I actually slowed that sequence way down from a scene where she says, she's saying something and her mouth just happens to be open for a while. And so I slowed it way down so I could have a clip of her with her mouth open and I just put a scream in there. Mm -hmm. So that whole sequence is built up from half the scenes wow. that we actually had. That's amazing. Couldn't do that back in the day, could oh, you? No. Well, of course, we didn't have sound. In the we day, didn't have either. sound, but, but fortunately, we were able to at least save that enough so that it's in the movie, but it's only half of what it should have been, and mm -hmm. I, that's a disappointment. Yeah. Well, that's and cool. I forgot you what your question resurrect was. it that much, though, and save it. Well, at least we got to keep her, because that's her big scene. She's, it's her whole bit, and I, didn't, I wanted to make sure that was in there, but I forgot what your question was. <laughs> okay. No, you've, you've answered it. Let's move on. Why, now, okay, vampire movie. Why explosions, and was that one of the biggest problems you guys ran into? That's totally self Self-gratifying. Okay. <laughs> I, when we were making my eight millimeter movies, I figured out a way to make laser beams, and it, it involved yep. bleaching the film. And I remember it bleaches the emulsion off, mm -hmm. and which I thought was like, I'm a scientist. <laughs> I've invented this because we had movies where guys would do this, and then guys would go, oh, but there, no, there was nothing that happened, and it was so irritating. Yeah. And I, being ADD, I could sit in my room for hours trying to figure out how to fix this. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that when you ran film through the gate enough, it would scratch the film and it would be permanently on there. And I thought, well, okay, if that's permanently on there, what if I was to purposely scratch the film where I need it to be, mm -hmm. and then it would always be there? And that evolved into the bleaching the film, and, and it made laser beams. But if it hit a person, you can make the person glow and disappear. That was fine. But if the laser beam hit the ground, there was no reaction. And at first it didn't bother me, but over a year or so, I was bothers me that there's nothing happening when... The laser hit the ground, but hey. There's no reaction. So mm -hmm. I started doing my thing, thinking about things for hours and hours on end, and I came up with a way. It's, it's, it's an explosive to a degree. It's, it's a couple of tablespoons of black gunpowder. I'm not going to really tell anybody how I do it, because I don't want anybody... Cause, yeah, making it at home. Well, I'll do with 20 things with this. <laughs> but what it is, it's, it's basically a thing, and there's a small amount of stuff, but it's in a paper container wrapped up with duct tape. So when it goes, there's no shrapnel. You can stand right next to it. Nobody can get hurt unless sometimes on top of this thing we put flour, like baking flour. Mm -hmm. So when the little reaction happens, it forces all the flour up in the air and it looks like an explosion. Mm -hmm. So I did that, but the only time it ever appears in a movie is I put it inside a hollow head made out of wax in the dead, the zombie movie, and it blows the head up. Which, that happens because scanners came out and it has an exploding head and I wanted to see if I could accomplish that. <laughs> so, it's never been in a film that I've made. And I'm like, well, here we have a chance for making movies again. Why don't we... I want explosions because I invented that. I would like to see that in a movie. Now, it makes no sense that vampires would have explosions. You have to kill them with a stake or removing their head. But Brandon's character, Kelly, is like this out-of-control kind of uh, commando wannabe. And I figured he would be the kind of guy that would think this way. He thinks vampires are coming. He would put explosive charges around as, as a defensive perimeter. Mm -hmm. And it would, gave me a way to work my explosions that I never really put in a movie into, into one of my movies. So it was strictly me wanting to do 
put something that I'd invented okay. 30 years ago. It was way cool, though, to have those explosions and actually work that into the script and into the whole project. So what were the biggest problems you guys ran into in, in uh, making the Scrim Chronicles? Oh, biggest problems. What were the biggest problems? Did any come to right your mind? The biggest problems? Oh, the biggest. There were several. One of them was just the sheer number of people in it and getting them a lot all together. And but again, our rule has always been, if you want to be in our movie, just ask. If you mm -hmm. ask, we'll work you in. And um, so, and we had a lot of people that wanted to be in it. So I'm like, yeah, cool, we'll work you in. But scheduling was probably yeah. one of the major. So, well, yeah, it's a, it's a double edged sword. We want more people because we want people to be a part of it. And we want them to have fun and enjoy but, it. And, you know, that's why we do them, is because yeah. we want them to have fun. People, people have, people have their the lives. Same time is really yeah. tricky. But they, yeah, and, and the rule is your life comes before making an, an amateur film. So, scheduling, probably the number one problem. Probably, yeah. Uh, there, there was others, there was the lost footage. The lost yeah, footage thing, that was a nightmare. Uh, I, I, I sweated that for months. I kept going back to it and, and looking at it. And how can I fix this? Mm -hmm. And I had it edited for a long time without her screaming. But it makes no sense. She's being chased by, or followed down the street. She hears the footsteps. She turns around. There's nothing there. And then when, when her dead friend finally appears, she's just like, oh, how are you? Or, <laughs> and there's no reaction. Hey, that just drove me crazy. So then you got them figured out how to get the scream in there. Well, in this movie, I finally learned how to do slow motion. Mm -hmm. Which ends up being mindlessly simple. Any chimp can do it, but I I couldn't figure out what the connectors were in the editing program to make it work. Well, I finally figured it out. So I used a lot of slow motion in this movie. Cool. But I slowed it that one scene where her mouth is open when she's talking to almost a dead stop, and then I just put a, a scream sound effect in there, and, and that saved that whole thing. Which that, is so neat. that was that was. And that was another thing where I spent hours just thinking about it. I'm at work working, and I'm just thinking, what can I do? How can I fix this? Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing. I'm trying to think. So what I, I was at that long day in Payson. Got tricky. Just because there was like 3 a.m. We, we, we were there 15 hours. Mm -hmm. Everybody arrived around 11, 30, 12 o'clock. Yeah, it seemed to be that lag toward the, toward the end of it. And well, you saved my butt on well, that whole thing. because we got. <laughs> you I, were getting a little frosty. All day, I, I was looking forward to shooting the battle scene. I couldn't wait to set off the explosions, and I couldn't wait to see everybody running around. But we had so much to shoot all day. Mm -hmm. We shot your scenes in the, in the kitchen where Beth, Heather shows up. And that was fun. You guys outside talking in the front yard and the backyard. And all that stuff had to be shot in the daytime. And quite frankly, I was, from the time we, in the middle of writing this movie till about July, I was really afraid that we were never going to finish this movie. Mm -hmm. I knew when we were writing it, we're overwriting, we're putting too much in this. And I've done that in the past where you... No! I know. <laughs> where you just get to where, okay, and you just give up and you don't. And I didn't want this movie to end up being half done and the footage just sits in a, on a hard drive somewhere and, and no one ever, we never get to finish it. Mm -hmm. And I sweated that. I really worried about it. Until that day in Payson, we shot like two-thirds of that movie in 15 hours. We shot over 500 scenes that day. Yeah, I don't know what time it was, but getting past, uh, sometimes past midnight, it was like you were you had that glazed donut look in your eye. I, I really did. Somebody missed snack time. And I, for, well, we even went and got food. <laughs> it, it and you got brought donuts. Stupid, yes. like, about midnight. I, I, it just got totally tired. And that was the midnight. that was the thing I'd looked forward to shooting the most, and well, I was the, so tired. Well, the donut, just, you probably got donut spikes, too. It's like, oh, sugar high, sugar, ooh, high, sugar high crash. Sugar, sugar crash. Yeah. And I lost track of the script. I just started inventing stuff. I was just making it up. And you actually grabbed the script and, and reined me back in. Randy, you got to have this and you got to have this. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just was going off into La La Land and I was just making stuff up. I'm formulaic. That's part of my OCD kicking up. You know? so, so I'm glad you had that there. I'm it was really that we good that you did that or we would have just ended up with tons of footage. That we might know. still be there. <laughs> I don't know what time you guys got home. I got home at 3.30 in the morning. There was that whole sequence where I was trying to kill a vampire. And you were trying to direct me. Oh, that oh, was hilarious! It was 2, two, two o'clock in the morning. I ended up not putting that on the on the gag reel. And the only reason I didn't is you don't hear all the people laughing. He would, the, I, the, at oh, that man. point, I, and that was just another thing that I just made up because I was so tired. I had Eric Parker come up behind Ryan Borgmeyer. And, and, and Eric was the vampire and Ryan was one of the good guys. And you were supposed to come up behind him with a stake and just ram it into his back or something yeah, and just, kill him on the spot. I remember that. Totally unsafe, so I was trying to... Totally unsafe. and you know, I was trying and, to fix it, but it didn't look right. Well, it was not part of the script anyway, but you would come up and you would come up behind him and go, <laughs> and I'm like, this is horrible. And I'm like, I can't hit him with it. It's, a, it's pointy enough on the end. It can, At one point I got up and I said, look, you got to sell it. you got to... Really hit it, and I think Trevor or somebody was shooting me, and I'm like, I'm not, like, not yelling at you, but I'm testy. Maybe well, in the yeah. next, maybe in the next blooper reel. Maybe I'll add it on, the, yeah. add it on yeah. here. Maybe. I think we shot it like five or six times, and you were getting more agitated, but I was getting pissed because I'm like, Well, this thing's really sharp. What am You're I like, supposed to do? I'm like, and I said, Well, put, the, and then I finally said, Put the stake, the sharp part in your hand, and leave the big part out, and just come up behind it, and really act like you 
Oh, and come down the hill. Stupid, because I, and I was holding it wrong. And it was miserable. And, and Eric's trying to react like it hurts. And the whole <laughs> thing was, and it wasn't in the script anyway. I just started inventing stuff for no reason because I was just really tired. But it might have been the best ten minutes of the whole shoot for everybody around because it was just everybody so else ridiculous. thought it was hilarious. <laughs> this we were is, both upset. We should have laughed more, but we had. Uh, everybody you know, was so tired. If we would have laughed, it probably wouldn't have gone that long. So and we then, were amused. Then the scene where Trevor <laughs> takes the pumpkin back in the house and you're with him and all that. That was three o'clock in the morning. We all wanted to go home. Wait, we got to get these other shots. I don't. We got to do this before we leave because I don't want to come back down here again. My parents were like really cool. Oh, and, yeah. From really letting close. us do that, Absolutely. and they just let us run all around the house, and hopefully we cleaned everything up and put everything back. But that was about three in the morning. Yep. Or two thirty or whatever. Yeah, that, oh, that did that go pretty late. We left till three. But when we, I, I got Kelsey. I took. I gave Kelsey a ride home. And I think we got home. I got her home about three fifteen, and I got here about three thirty. So that was a really long day. But after that day was over, that was the first time I really thought, you know, we're going to finish this movie. Because we shot like two-thirds of that movie that one day. And then I got really confident. Okay, we're going to finish this movie. Thank goodness. So, yeah, that, that was the make or break day. And it really ended up letting... I got confident after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Well, and we shot every scene that you're in that day. Yeah, that was uh, that was one and done for me. So that worked out. That worked out real well. Although I had so much fun, I would have, you know, when some some of the things were coming up for like the the stuff in the gym and all that, I almost wanted to gravy train and say, "Hey, I could probably work it. I get over there." But I thought, "Nah, I don't want to be a nudge." Well, don't worry. We're going to get you in the next one. Okay. Yeah, we're going to make you a scientist in the next one. You'll love that. Blinded me with science. <laughs> okay. Is there? Uh, okay, this one's for Randy. Is there anything you won't show in your movies? Bears, there's a, there's a laundry you have, list. You won't have, you won't have bare-chested uh, vampires. There's a laundry list of things. Number one, God, that's an interesting question. Number one, I'll never show a guy with a knife, a guy with a chainsaw, a guy with an axe. I hate those. The one movie, but I a like, sharp stick, you will. Yeah, or, or knives. <laughs> in my case. Well, I'm about okay. monsters. I like. I've always liked monsters. I like creating them. I like sculpting them. I like. I like trying to figure out how what what they are and how they work and what their fun functions are. That's fun. Guy with a knife, guy with a chainsaw, whatever, maniac on the loose, is just a guy slaughtering people. Yeah. And it's a makeup artist, or a special effects makeup artist's thing. He gets to cut a guy's head off or disembowel them, or like the Saw movies. It's just slaughter for an hour and a half, and I'm not interested in that at all. So I've I'll never, never seen that. I've had those described to me, and I, eat, I won't watch them. No. I, we had that, those came around in the 80s. We had splatter movies in the 80s, and then it, and people got really tired of them fast, and they went away, and now they're back. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not interested in just showing slaughter. That's not what I'm about. I'm about monsters. Mm -hmm. I love monsters. Good. I'm not ever going to show nudity or sex or any of that stuff. Number one, it's our friends in this movie. I, it wouldn't even enter my mind to go, hey, how about taking your creepy. shirt off? No, <laughs> creepy! Creepy on a level I don't even know how to explain. Yeah. And, but for another... A little lighthearted romance. But I'm not, I'm not even going to do... Here's the thing. Our movies are very one-dimensional. Mm -hmm. There's a monster. The good guy's got to stop them. That's pretty much all they are. I don't write in a lot of subplots and this guy's cheating on his wife while he's trying to fix the monster and this guy's got a heart... I'm, and I don't do that because I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. I like monsters. I want the good guys. I mean, I want to develop your guys. You're, you're in Angus' characters. I want to get a rapport and, and get John involved and, 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 and Trevor's character. And I want to develop some of that. But I'm really not... Not going to go overboard. So I'm not going to have romance. I'm not going to have couples dealing with whatever. I'm just not going to do it. Self, could you call it self-gratuitous directorial simplicity? Maybe. Wow. How about that? Whoa. I couldn't even say that. I just I just brought that off the top of my wow, head, that's too. awesome. So, yeah, there's a lot of things okay. that I won't show. And I'm not going to show... what Another thing I'm not going to do is what I would call pornographic gore. I, I understand from what you're saying. That. And that goes back to the whole saw chainsaw thing and well, all that. And it's so I easy mean, to do. Basically, yeah. you would, for, as an example, make a... Make a False body with an open hole where the intestines are supposed right. to be. Get a shirt, rot it up with bleach, put it over the top of it. Fill the, go to a, a slaughterhouse, get pig guts, and fill that whole area with guts. Yeah. Pour a bunch of blood and stuff in there and have your monster rip that open and yeah. let all that tumble Spill out. You. Okay. Okay. We what's, could do it, but why? What's the point? Just to gross Just out. Just to gross people out. Yeah. And I, I'm, I mean, again, I like monsters. I'm not about... Mm -hmm gore and slaughter and yeah. so I'm not going to do any of that. There's, there's enough of the blood biting and all that for me. That that pushes the envelope enough for me. Well, I, I'm not against blood. Yeah. Uh, I'll show blood. Blood is carol syrup. So yeah. it doesn't affect me. <laughs> I know what it really is. It's carol syrup with some stuff added yeah. to it. And, and that's good to bring that up too. Well, here's another for thing about, the viewers of this video. Here's another thing about blood that's ridiculous. Blood is actually like water. It's water thin. Uh, but if you take water and color it red and have somebody spit it out, it looks ridiculous on a movie. Yeah. So you take carol syrup, it's way too thick to be blood, it makes no sense. But you spit that out of your mouth, or you have that, 
And it's like, ooh. Yeah. I don't understand what makes that happen because clearly blood is not thick like that. Okay, here's the, here's the test question for you. Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, what was the blood? It was Hershey's Chocolate. Yes, sir. You passed. I, fact, knew, I knew you would know that. I it, knew you in would all know that. black and white horror movies, though. it was just standard practice. Hershey's, Hershey's syrup, Hershey's syrup there was, you go. The, was blood. Yeah. And uh, I guess there's a lot of women that still can't take showers these days for that reason. For yeah. that movie. Well, I am a, I am a, I am a, uh, a student of, of that. Well, no, not, but okay. just horror movies and makeup artists and all right. that stuff. I, I, I read that stuff all the time. Excellent. Let's go to Brandon now. Okay, okay. Brandon, you get the first shot at this oh, one. Let's do it. What's the favorite, what's the favorite thing that... that uh, that you shot in this movie, that you actually were that you were behind the camera shooting. Oh, behind the camera. Actually, you didn't shoot anything. Let's say that. I didn't shoot a lot. Let's say that first. Just, just, did just a couple just things. Just to clarify. Okay. There were this movie. Uh, I don't mean to digress here, but I want to explain something. Okay. In, in Werewolf Two, I really wasn't sure I could make a movie. I, I hadn't done it in almost thirty years. Right. So that was really a, a test, just to see if I could do it again. And I, I was really worried about the first day. What if I don't know how to do this anymore? And, of course, half an hour in, I was like, oh, yeah, this is how it is. Okay, this is pretty cool. <laughs> it all came back. But everything is shot on a tripod. Right. right. And it's just lockdown shots, every one of them. And that's boring. So with, with vampires, I wanted to really experiment with the camera, at least from my perspective, for what I'm able to do. But I really don't like handheld camera work because it's jerky and it gives yeah. you... There's a horror director, and I don't know how you pronounce his name. It's spelled... It looks like Yui Bo. Okay. And I don't like his movies because he purposely shakes the camera like this. And he puts purposely things out of focus. And it's just, and it gives, he has one movie that I like called The Seventh Moon. It takes place in China. Amy Smarts. And it's kind of, kind of creepy. But it's this the whole time. So it's the Blair Witch Project effect? I think it's, I think he actually directed that too. Oh, okay. And by the end I have like a headache. I'm like, oh. I've heard a lot of people describe that. I've never seen it. It's, it's like the vomit cam. It's what I, okay. that's how I explain it. It's the vomit. <laughs> you watch enough, bleh. But I wanted to, with vampires, I wanted to really work with the camera, and I wanted a lot of moving shots, and I just happened to be walking through a Walmart, and they had a monopod in their camera section, which is just a tripod that just one leg. Yeah. And it's for, like, if you're on a hill, to help hold it still. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at it, I go, what if we left that retracted, and it was just, like, this long, and the weight of the bottom of it would help to keep the camera more steady. steady. And it worked. I mean, if you watch the movie, it still shakes more than I want it to. But... But it get left us free. Variety. It left us free to do almost every shot handheld. There's almost no tripods at all. Nice. Tripod shots at all. Okay, let me change that question, Brandon. His okay. His favorite things shot this movie, uh, you know, either behind or in uh, front of the camera, as far as scenes go. And uh, that question can actually be for both of you. For what, think, what are your favorite scenes? No, I talked way too much. Yeah, go, I, go, Brandon. Well, then I was in all this segment for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here to hold down this side of the camera. Well, the whole room is bouncing out. Yeah. And it's, thank, yeah. thank you for being here. Um, I think the funnest thing that we shot was probably the rock band sequence in, in the church. Yeah. But for one, it was yeah. really... We were sweating that for a long time, so we were like, "What are we gonna? Where are we gonna shoot this? We need a hall. What are we gonna do?" Well, you and I talked about that. We wanted that to be one of the creepiest scenes. Mm -hmm. It's early in the movie. I wanted. I, I approached my friend Eric Parker, who works with us, if he would be willing to do the soundtrack movie music, mm -hmm. and he was like, "Yeah." He, he jumped right on that. That's so neat. And then I said, "Well, wait a minute. Would you like to be in the movie? Why don't you get the band together? We'll have you guys play a song, and then you guys can all be slaughtered." And he really liked that. I said, "Yeah." <laughs> so he talked to the band, and apparently they were up for it because they did the shot. So you and I were really into that scene. Yeah. I really wanted that to be creepy, mm -hmm. but we couldn't figure out where to shoot it. Go ahead. I, yeah, I, I so, didn't mean to interrupt. But it's all right. I'm used to it. <laughs> I'm just here for looks. <laughs> and we're hurting right there, aren't we? <laughs> He's we are, not just the president of Haircut for Men. He's also a client. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And it's working wonders. Sorry, I didn't mean to go for that <laughs> um, one. I so, shot it right for that one, and I shouldn't have. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Brandon. sorry, brother. Uh, go ahead, Brandon. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're done now. Um, so next show, next show might not, next movie right. might not even take place. So, now. Go ahead, Brandon. Rock band sequence. We must have been worried about that for four or five, six months. Uh, at least, at least the location. Months. Really? We, we couldn't no figure to shoot it. Okay. And we kept thinking, well, if we can get a cultural hall, but what church, you know, who's going to let us go in there and kill vampires? Or, kill, you know, have vampires kill people? In Especially in a church. church. They're, they're, you know, evil in a church. That's so, and we're, and we're so where'd you go? How did Self-righteousness is, is a big deal around here. So, well, we were out goofing around. Out here, we were shooting something else. Or we were getting ready to do something, and somebody from your Tim board Western came by. Rolled who's, up. Who's in, the, who's in the ward just over here. Uh -huh. And he's talking to me. We're both motorcycle racing guys. And, yeah. he, and I said, well, I hate to ask this, but could we go in there? We need a, we need a place to shoot this scene. And he was like all about it. Yeah, that's great. Of course you can. Really? Oh, yeah, it's not a problem. Like, really? Like, we, we were just like, you've got to be just pissing with us right now. Like, no <laughs> You're going to let us in there. Pissing with us? <laughs> or, yeah. I don't remember that happening. So, 
<laughs> I'm like, this is this guy is either out of his mind or he's just the coolest guy. Of but we're gonna take advantage of him because he said yes. He said yes. So, <laughs> we're done. That was probably a month or more before we actually shot it. But he showed up, let us in. Let us in. Let us have. Fr and then he helped us move oh, cables around and how lines. Cool is that? He let us, He helped us clean the blood up off the floor after we were done. Mm -hmm. Kelsey showed up with her hair all dyed, yeah. more like Rocky. She was really good about stuff like that. She she ch apparently check out the scene and she would adjust her costume for that. Yeah. It was really cool that she did that. And so then the rock band took I don't know how long to set up, and then you shot them over and over again. Over the and song. Over. They couldn't get they couldn't get their song lined up with that timer thing. Yeah, or something. And so well, that was must have been at least an hour of just that one shot. Just trying to get this. Band so Jared and I ran all over this church, just thinking of all the ideas we could. Mm -hmm. for the vampires to be creepy and where they're going to kill people and we just that there were lights the, the church had like those fogged up windows like you can't see through them they're trans, translucent but not yeah. transparent so right yeah and so we start messing with like what if they come up because we'll see a shadow and that looked really cool and we saw some doors that had the same glass and we did stuff there and there was you a, found that cabinet that Kelsey's yeah, in that was up above the cultural there's like some weird stairways that we used. She comes, times. yeah. Kelsey comes down the stairway. So you got all those ideas while that was taking place, yeah. and that was all them too, because I was focused on getting we the band thing done. And these two guys came up with all those shots, That's which neat. was really Just cool. Thinking, like this might look cool, and that, I mean, we went around. Which all we should place. also mention. Darren was supposed to be with us tonight to do this, but he he had a bad cold, oh, sorry, and he yeah. went in to get this medicine, and they gave him the wrong medicine. They gave him an antipsychotic medicine. Oh, and that was during that time. No, this has just been recently. Okay. This has just been, and he was. And of course, if you're not psychotic and they give you a psychotic medicine, it just totally trashes. He was in the hospital for like a week. I remember hearing about and that. And he's still not really getting over it all the way. Oh, I mean, he's doing a lot better. He's doing a lot that's better. Good. And um, But he's still not up to... So, shout out to Darren. Yeah. We wish you were here doing this with us. Because he's really funny. He would have had a lot of insight and a lot of things to say. But And I got it. We're shooting this, so I got to get this on disc so you people can have a copy. That's true. But shout out to Darren. We mm -hmm. miss you. If you got the hat and the cane and the coat, I could wear it and I could be like playing the part of Darren, yeah. a big geeky guy. I actually <laughs> talked to him today. I said, "Is there any way you can make?" And he goes, See, "I got some plans tonight." And, and all oh, good for that's him. cool. That's so, all right. But we miss him. But anyway, go on. Yeah. But anyway, all those scenes were was them. They that's found neat. all the locations. That is, Basically, that is so after cool. after the band was killed, mm -hmm. which took a little while. That was fun to shoot, though. Then yeah. we just said, "Like, do this, Randy. Come over here. You do this." Yeah. Just got, that, directed, got really. that extra footage and, and actually, boom, you're, you're it done. It took so long with the band. With the band. Trying it's to figure everything out that it was... Mm -hmm. But they really directed all happened. those scenes of the... Because the band's playing and I cut in all these scenes of the, of the vampires moving and coming closer and all that. Mm -hmm. kind of, and that was all their stuff. Neat. And the, speaking of uh, adventures, how about the Salt Flat Adventures discuss? Oh, <laughs> how did that go? So, <laughs> <laughs> so this was just one of, those, one of those things that who knows how, why it worked out. How long did it take for being out there to do 20 that? 20 minutes? Half an hour? That's all? Yeah, that's that's how We long. drove an hour and a half out there, okay. 20 minutes, got some Burger King. I don't even think it was that long. I mean, it was probably 50, 15, 10, minutes? 15 minutes we were done. Yeah. Because we knew what we, we wanted before we got there. And got some food and drove back. So it was it was <laughs> four hours round trip for, yeah. for 15, 20 minutes. Of, well, in the, in it the movie, it's 58, minutes. 58 seconds, that mm -hmm. sequence. So we drove all the way down there for a 58 second. Yeah. And, and 20 yeah. minutes to shoot the 58. Yeah. And so he called me up one day and said, hey, can you drive and I'll get lunch? I'm like, all right. So we drove out there. You, you fly, I'll buy. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> we drive all the way out to frickin' the Salt Flax, an hour and a half, two hours away, whatever it was. An hour and a half. And we're thinking we're going to go out on the Bonneville Raceway where there's nothing and all just expanse. And we get out there and it's a race day. It's motorcycle speed speed week. Uh, and I wanted to be way out there. So yeah. there was nothing around us. So he's just in the middle of nowhere is the idea. And so we got out there and we're like... And they wanted 20 bucks just to drive out there. Yeah, just to drive out there. And we're like... No. Like, I don't think so. Like, would you just walk out over here? All right. And we're like, this is just a total waste of our time. This isn't going to work. But So because like, because you were there? I mean, if you were... We're there. there. we got to do like, something. If you were there any other time, it wouldn't have cost the 20 well, bucks? unless the cars were out. I mean, yeah. most of the time we go out there, when I go, we go to Wendover or whatever... Out. We just drive out there and drive around really fast on the salt flats for an hour and then yeah. go home. But this time, but this time they, they were hey, charging. Twenty us. bucks boil. And I'm not. Well, and we couldn't go out where we wanted to anyway because the bikes were out there. Yeah. Which is cool, but they're, they're bikes. But it was messing up messing up by shooting. Yeah. Okay. So our first thought is this is all a complete waste of time. We're not going to get anything accomplished. We came out here about to come out here again, just for this footage. But yeah. But as soon as we said that, I'm like, no way are we coming out here again. So we're like, let's One. just walk that way and just see what happens. We probably walked what 300 feet. Four hundred feet. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe three hundred feet. And that's when you found the spot. And we're like, well, from from our from the road, it was just like all crusted, 
weird looking salt. I'm like this is just not going to work. But there was some really flat stuff, like I don't know, half mile away. Yeah. And we, get well, we thought we were going to walk that far. Yeah, we get walking. All of a sudden, we're like, this actually looks really cool right where we are with all the ripples and the salt. Mm -hmm. we're like, let's just try it. And it worked out. And it works brilliantly. And you know, there's a whole expanse behind me. You can't tell what's there. It's just just open land. If you watch the gag reel. I actually at one point turned around and there's a road right there. Yeah. Yeah. The road's a couple hundred feet away. But shooting it this way, it looks like we're in the... And, and then I, nowhere. I went into the editing program and there's all these different ways you can modify the, the footage you shot. And mm -hmm. I found that orange, it's called Sunset something or other. And I thought, well, that looks kind of cool. And I went through a bunch of other things and I kept coming back to it. I really like the way that looks. And I ended up just converting just all that. the footage to that orange and yellow that you see in the movie. Mm -hmm. And it actually doesn't... It looks pretty cool. Yeah. Well... You, the original idea with that was just make the sky look really weird and everything else looks normal. Oh. But you couldn't get the sky to chroma key. I was thinking we could just chroma key the sky. It's mostly blue. Chroma key the sky. We'll turn it all black. It didn't work. So we had on the salt flats. Well, this, the, it's never one color of blue. Yeah. It, it's different colors of blue. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it worked sort of, but it, it, not good enough. It just kind of yeah. was just irritating. <laughs> and I thought it'd be cool to have the sky black and maybe animate lightning bolts just out of a clear sky or black sky. I thought that would be kind of cool. And I made a picture that kind of illustrate how I wanted it to look, mm -hmm. but it looked awful. So it's all that way to shoot and it was just Burger King you guys ate? Yep, yeah, Burger King. Yeah, that's oh, there you go. So the Wendover Burger King and then all the way back. Take two hands. Were out, shoot, Burger King, out. Gotta love the Whopper. It was... Okay, last last one. Okay. Uh, okay, any other parting shots on the whole project and what's next for you guys? Well... Number one, I'm gonna. I'm where I was in about November of 1976. I'm feeling exactly the same way. We shot werewolves and vampires and, and all that. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it just had that nice cadence to it. But it got boring. I'm like, okay, these are other people's monsters. And, and, and yeah, did you realize that was the bicentennial year? It was. I graduated from high school in the bicentennial wow. year. We did Attack of the That's Werewolf crazy. as I was graduating from high school. Crazy. Whenever I watch that movie, it's one of my favorite movies from back then because it reminds me of graduating. And I couldn't wait to get out of high school. I was not a school guy. And it's a patriotic type of memory, too. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> but by the time we'd done Werewolves and Vampires, I'm like, this is kind of boring. I would rather do my own thing. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I'm feeling the same way now. We've done Werewolves, Vampires, blah, blah, blah. And I... I haven't sculpted anything in a long time, and I just sent off for that. I should go get that thing, that head that you saw, that mm -hmm. you guys have seen. Mm -hmm. And so I can start sculpting my own monsters again. And I like that idea. I like we decide what the monster is and what it does and, and what it's about and what its motivation is and what its supernatural mm -hmm. powers are. That's fun. And that always makes me more interested. But we got to rescue him. He's still stuck out there. I'm, I'm stuck in the middle of the saw flats in yellowness. In orange, orange. And we, we got some really good ideas as far as what to do. Well, with and that. you have to come back because you know you. I've known you my whole life, and I don't really want to make movies unless you're with us. What happened. <sighs> <laughs> Pay the light Supernatural. bill. Supernatural. Supernatural. Right. I guess that almost means we're done, unless you want me to go get. Well, get no, that that this will still work. Okay. Um, so we have to rescue him. And at first, I was thinking there's a there's a shot in Vampires where. Darren's in the park, and he's that's where the, my stepdaughters were slaughtered in the werewolf, right. where their, heads get, their head comes off and all that, and he's looking around, and he's, what is it about this place? And I, I put that in there, because I thought in the third one, we'd have some kind of, Marius gets all that knowledge from killing Heather. and yeah. now Marius, he, by the way, is incredibly cool. Isn't he cool? Oh my gosh. He was another one. I didn't. I forgot to mention that. When I was thinking of who should, originally I thought, I'll play Marius, but I, I don't want to, no, I, I, <laughs> and the lights are back, and the lights are on, and the lights are on, and the lights are on. And the lights are on. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I, I got rid of that idea right off the bat because I don't. I wanted to spend more time with the camera, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to be slight. It's tradition, by the way, for me to die in my movies, so I just wanted to be in there long enough to get slaughtered. And, and okay, yeah, I'm done. True. And I'm like, well, who would make a good Marius? And, and Daniel Wise works. We're, we work together at work. Right off the bat, he would be perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if he'll do it. And I went up and said, Would you be? Oh yeah, that'd be cool. Mm -hmm. Done. So he now has, anyway has all this knowledge of where you are. So, I originally thought, well, once he knows, there'll be this weird portal that's been opened in that park, and that's why the evil things keep happening in that park, the, the evil creatures are drawn to that okay. portal that no one can see, but now we can see because Marius can make it visible. However, some something like that. Kind of the equivalent of that, uh, the uh, the portal in 
Ghostbusters. Where's the gatekeeper? <laughs> well, or, or that one Star Trek episode where they jump through that round yeah. thing and they end yep. up in, in the past or whatever. Some, something along that lines. I very vague idea. That was in Star Trek too. Well, because Star I, Trek the TV show. Okay, well, because I can remember that from. Now we're going to all sorts of other movie things. The uh, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide. They have that. They jump through a thing too. Oh, really? Yeah. Have you ever seen Hitchhikers? <laughs> <It's pretty> ridiculous. <laughs> we I'm actually scared. Up. Okay. So, but but now I'm I'm kind of leaning. I, I've been watching a lot of the old Outer Limits episodes again because I I always seem to go back to those. And I just got in the mail uh, a CD, three CD set of all the first season, which is only the only really good season mm -hmm. of all of Dominic Frontieri's music from the Outer Limits. And so I'm just like really in Outer Limits heaven right now. And I started thinking it might be more cool if and, and you like the idea of being a scientist. Oh yeah. They come and you're John Cartoni, so you're related to him, so you might be trying to figure something out. <laughs> and and maybe you've created this portal that's interdimensional. You're trying. You're a scientist trying to study other dimensions or whatever. I haven't really even gotten to that yet. So we might be getting into Stargate uh, land here. Perhaps Stargate theory to get me out. Okay. Yeah. Something like that. I, I, it's, it's still very vague. I mean, I'm I've just finished the Vampires. And I'm really tired. I don't really want to. We'll think just about do movies. something with Phantasm. Two steel rods in a white room. <laughs> 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 little MacGyver stuff. Well, I'm thinking it, it won't be hard to build some kind of an arch with some lights on it, and, mm. and just put a green screen behind it, and you can Yourself. put anything you want in there. Sounds great. And I'm thinking if we can go in there and rescue him somehow, bring him back, and maybe we're so happy that we rescued him that the portal stays on, and then this creature. Who forgot to turn this off? <laughs> well, and that's kind of very outer limitsy. That you know, the Jarvis kind of and turning it off. And so I, I don't know, but I don't know where it's going to go. It's still gonna, a work in progress. We got to talk uh, about it. Yeah. And start writing and all but that. But right now it's time to keep basking in the glow of the Agnes Scrim Chronicles Vampire. I'm just so it's glad it's done. available at a, on Facebook near you and soon to be on DVD. Randy Robbins, Jim Gaslam, Brandon Rob. Uh, yes, it's sure. a pleasure talking to you. And that, my friends, as we say in the business and in this cold, cold it's garage, extremely cold. is a wrap. I can't feel oh, my fingers. Good night now! Alright. Thanks, Jim. You betcha. This was actually kind of fun. Oh, yes, it was.